Welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to look at a virtual hospital where real doctors can expand their medical training by working on virtual patients. It's called Clinispace, and its goal is to train medical personnel to act quickly and accurately in high pressure situations such as mass casualty incidents. Clinispace won the 2011 grand prize of $25,000 at the Federal Virtual Worlds Challenge sponsored by the U.S. Army Research Lab. In a few minutes, we'll have a demonstration of Clinispace, but I'd now like to introduce my guests who were the co-creators of Clinispace, Dr. Leroy Heinrichs and Parvati Dev. Leroy Heinrichs, MD, PhD, is co-founder and executive medical director of Innovation and in Learning, which is a company that develops learning technologies for the healthcare market. He's also Professor Emeritus and former department chair of obstetrics and gynecology at Stanford Medical Center, and he also spent several years developing computerized 3D models of human anatomy. Parvati Dev, PhD, is co-founder and CEO of Innovation and in Learning. She was also the founder of Summit Labs at Stanford University, which is an internationally recognized learning technologies lab that did pioneering work using computer technology for medical education. She also developed the first commercially available 3D imaging system for surgical planning. Dr. Heinrichs, exactly what sort of things do medical people learn in Clinispace? What's the main strength of this product? People come to Clinispace to have experiences in a immersive environment that's much like a, a real place, like an emergency department or another hospital bed room, and to take care of patients that respond as they would expect them to do in real life. So they practice here before they go out to real patients? It is a way of learning, having experiences, preparing them for seeing real patients, and it's a place where they can fail safely without harming anyone. Now, Parvati, I understand that Clinispace recently won a pretty important prize. What can you tell us about that? We were very excited about it. We won the Federal Virtual World Challenge Prize, and uh, this is organized by the U.S. Army Research Labs. Uh, and we won it for two things. One was for the artificial intelligence that we have in Clinispace, in, our pro in the objects, in the patients and then the grand prize over all the categories. Now, does the fact that this is sponsored by the U.S. Army indicate that this might have a lot of application in a military setting? Absolutely. While we began with what you would call civilian settings, um, we have found that the military is very interested. So we are actually talking with some branches of the military about modifying it for the Army medic in the field, for the Air Force medic who's doing the evacuation. It's really quite interesting what can be done. So Dr. Heinrichs, is there still a lot of development to go with this product? I've seen demonstrations of it. It seems like the sort of thing that could just keep growing indefinitely. You have captured it correctly. It's a beginning product and we're focusing on things for nurses at this time and we're also uh, reaching out to more and different kinds of physicians and pre-professionals as well. Now I understand that you have a short movie on the computer here which will give a little background. Why don't we get, go ahead and see that film and then we'll talk some more. Okay, let me begin it and here it is um, and I will start it now. <coughs> And so Adiana is a company, a sales company with whom we've worked and plenty of space is our place. Here is one of the rooms going into a supply cabinet and we'll show you things very quickly here to show how you as a facilitator can set things up. Everything is interactive. Even the PowerPoint on the wall that you see can be played. You can enter the space quickly because it's browser based and not uh, requiring a heavy-duty computer. Here's an example room, still another room. You can choose the avatar that you want to look like today. 
and you, you want for the role that you've been assigned. So you create your own character, your own doctor or nurse? That's correct. And so the instructor might ask you as a physician to play the nurse today. And that will give you a perspective. Here's the electronic medical record, a uh, high level a requirement in medicine these days and a chance to learn it. Here you see a patient with a uh, wall monitor and their vital signs showing. You see in this environment you can have two separate patients and you do things with them. Here is illustrated somebody doing a CPR. So this is a movie with a lot of clips from different kinds of patients and these can be of one of several types. Here is a, a display of what the urine output was for that patient. Here is a demonstration of the vital signs, and we will talk about that medical model in a few minutes. Here is illustrated how you would uh, transfer knowledge into uh, a chart and for coders to learn to use. And so it serves multiple users. Here is part of what we call the back end, uh, where you record data. This is about uh, cardiac arrhythmias and uh, the kinds of common uh, conditions that physicians see and must prepare to see in the hospital. So these patients are dynamic and uh, the objects in the world are dynamic. And so for these reasons, it's one, the artificial intelligence. It's a number of smart objects and the patients behave correctly. Now is it pretty robust so everything in this virtual emergency room uh, would be in a real emergency room and vice versa so it, it, it's a full setup? Yes, not only for emergency but also for other kinds of medical conditions. You've earlier mentioned about mass casualties. Uh, we can have a lot of folks coming in and, and swamping the emergency department. Here we're illustrated too. And we could also have a neonatal, a, a baby, that must be resuscitated. And so it has multiple levels. Can it be customized so that the users can create their own patients or do you create all the patients? Oh, we expect people to create their own patients from the scenarios that they've already developed and in that way they apply the curriculum that's important to them and the scenarios and so we don't want to reinvent the wheel but this is a tool that many people can use. We actually have uh, the ability to uh, let a person set up an initial state of a patient and then some triggers and milestones so if the learner does the right things then the patient moves to a new state that is a, in a better situation or to a worse situation. We want a, a clock here whereas if you don't do anything the patient just dies? Yes, absolutely. If you don't, in, in our trauma case, if you don't do something within the first three minutes, if we set it for serious, then within three minutes that blood pressure is going to mm. plummet downwards. I would imagine though that you could pause it if you want, maybe even back up and do it again. We can pause it, we can restart it, Something yes. Something you can't do in the real world. That is absolutely, oh, absolutely true. Okay. Have you gotten any feedback from anybody? Has anybody said, you know, I used this and I, I was a better doctor as a result, I felt more confident in the real situation? Leroy? Yes, we've uh, done a number of studies uh, with a number of virtual worlds and a recent one that we had some 22 doctors and nurses from Stanford and San Mateo County who were uh, in world and they said, my oh my, what we have learned here that we didn't know. One physician said, I could feel my blood pressure going up as the patient's blood pressure was going down. They really identify with what's going on in this virtual environment. And in fact, in the mass casualty situation, uh, they really felt that their confidence in their ability to deal with a large number of patients simultaneously had improved through using the, the program. So, so this is basically helping your reactions. I mean, it's not the hands-on thing. It doesn't teach you how to right. wheel the scalpel, but it teaches you to think and respond quickly. Yep. Uh, teaches you about this loop of making observations in a clinical environment and thinking about now what next needs to be done and taking that action and then reflecting on it. And so it's the observation, the uh, 
uh, and then the re finally the reflection that allows you to go through the process again and again and again. Now I understand that you have an actual demonstration you're going to show us where you're going to be the physician and Parvati, you're going to be the nurse. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's go ahead and see what a live session looks like. Very well. And so this is the Honey Space environment and I see my colleague Dr. Dev is here and today we have in this in bed, bed A, a uh, woman who we identified earlier has been in an auto accident and she is hemorrhaging vaginally and we don't see the blood here yet because they've just cleaned the sheets but this patient and Parvati would you get the wall monitor up we need to know what's going on with this patient <laughs> sure absolutely and you see her, you hear yes, her coughing Dr. and so let's uh, and why okay. don't you do the same okay and so we'll put up her her monitor so, so that all of those things on the wall are active like you click on a device and it assumes a medical function and do full screen they so are and so uh, these are the smart objects we could take and show you uh, how everything in the world is is active and that is part of why it won the award uh, for artificial intelligence and so here you see, Parvati, would you get us a blood pressure by clicking on the headboard? Yes, and Dr. Heinrichs, I shall do it right away. And so when she does that. We have now put the blood pressure cuff on the patient. And if one's looking at the vital signs monitor, bingo, there you see the values. So it wants me to use the EMR so that and I have a positive identification with the patient and I'm not doing these actions on the wrong patient. It's a safety measure. Okay, so now Parvati just expressed a step that's necessary with every patient. You must identify the patient with their record and we use an armband in the hospital. We don't need to talk about armbands here, but to go through the thinking process. And we see a patient who is very hypovolemic and with a fast heart rate. We've got to do something about this, Parvati. Uh, let's give this patient some fluids, please. And go... Ready to give fluids? Yes. And so if we go to the IV stand, you'll get a menu and she can choose what kind of fluid and the dose <laughs> and the volume and how fast to give it. These are decisions that every clinician must make. And if she didn't understand me, She'll say, what did you say? Or did you say this? And that's the, how we uh, take care of patients. You see, in this world, the saline bags are hanging on the IV stand, indicating... Started two liters of normal saline, running uh, push. Very well. Now, this patient is hypotensive. Uh, blood pressure is low. So please go to the medication cabinet. This, I'm going to give you the verbal order to give the patient a vasopressor. And that's near the bottom of the list. We've got a whole bunch of drugs in this. Which case. vasopressor would you like, oh, Dr. Heinrichs? Uh, use dobutamide. It's a common one. It's readily available. Dobutamide at uh, 0.7 milligrams per minute, that, IV. That's correct. Put it right in the IV so she gets it quickly. And you've done that, and wow, it affected the blood pressure straight away. It's now up to 94, 95. So the things we're doing are working. Now, please go up and let's now find out, since the patient is getting better, what the problem really was by doing an ultrasound of her abdomen. We had the report that she ha was having, she's pregnant and she's bleeding, and she was having pain. And let's see what kind of condition she so has. Okay? Uh, and so if we go to the ultrasound machine and perform a scan, there we'll see a video clip showing, in fact, that there's a fetal head off to my left and a blood clot to the right. So this would lead a clinician to know, oh, this is a condition called abruptio placenta. And, <coughs> and it is safe to do a vaginal exam Whereas if it were another condition, it would not be safe. 
And so it's a differentiating uh, decision. <coughs> Please give the patient some, uh, check the uh, oxygenation by going to the headboard. Right away. And doing a finger clip, please. And let's see what the SAO2 shows and on the screen. Applying a finger clip, uh, SAO2 is reading at uh, 80? At 80, yes. Well, let's fix that. And, and the way to do that gives some oxygen. We start, can do, yeah. Shall I start the oxygen? Please, go to the gas machine where you'd find some oxygen. Giving oxygen by mask. That's good. And so the mask is on her face. And so we're now seeing this patient be stabilized. So I think in our demonstration, we've uh, seen a number of the dynamic aspects of Plenty Space that cause people to get excited because it's like real life. Poverty and my discussion would be like we would have beside the bed adjacent to a patient. Now right now you're talking to each other and you're sitting next to each other. When people are using space, they might be in totally different locations. How do they communicate Absolutely. then? Do you we would normally put headsets on, you know, we would wear headsets and this uh, world is voice enabled using uh, VOIP. So we've had people across the continent communicating, being together in this one space and feeling like they're really there together. Now, is this a finished product or is it still under development? I mean, is this ready to go to market or? We are, uh, we, yes, we are definitely selling it right now. Um, a lot of folks want to take what we have developed, think of it as a platform and build their own, uh, to their own specification on top of it. So we've had, um, for example, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement that does a lot of safety training for hospitals. And we've developed uh, safety uh, scenarios for them. Uh, the patient that you see in the next, uh, in, in the next bed uh, is a person who is undergoing, uh, in, he has infection. And that's the kind of person to whom we might uh, uh, give, uh, he might go on a ventilator. <coughs> And when he goes in a ventilator, there's a lot of risk for infection. So we are not going to put him on a ventilator right now, but we, mm -hmm. if we did that, we would want the nurse and the doctor to be, uh, to take certain precautions, such as um, removing sedation once a day to make sure that perhaps he can be taken off the ventilator. Uh, oral care, uh, raising the head of the bed so that he doesn't aspirate uh, liquids. Uh, and that kind of safety training is what they asked us to develop on top of Clinic Space. Now, is, you, is there usually somebody on the team who is the leader who is instructing everybody else, like the leader and the students? Yeah, Lira, why don't you? We do that several ways. Yes, at the beginning for initial training, uh, in fact, people are shown PowerPoint slides and videos to prepare them for uh, a uh, efficient use of this space and uh, time in class and so they usually go in groups of three to four individuals with a instructor and there are two beds here and so you can have two teams with two different patients and learning two different objects in today's lesson and that would be one way or you could use this as a way of having people be certified are they meeting the mark of of the excellence of care expected after a training. So the whole gamut from initial to end training. Well, it's a very impressive product. How long did it take to develop it? Well, you have to know that we have a long history behind this. We've been working with virtual worlds, developing them since 2004, when Adobe first came out with Atmosphere. Some of your audience might remember that. Um, so this is our fourth go around. We've worked with Adobe, we've worked with Olive, with Second Life, and we wanted to create something that was browser-based, did not need a lot of complex graphics, and we found Unity as a good engine on which to do this. When we, st when we started, it probably was six months from start to finish to have a complete working system, which I think is incredibly fast, actually. That's because we've done it many times before. What would you say was the hardest part of developing this? Mm. Is it the technical medical part or, or the software programming? Or? I think the virtual patient is pretty difficult because you're 
we are creating patients that uh, aren't just a little sick. They could be very, very sick. And there's very little data out there about, for example, the vital signs of a really sick person. So we had to talk with a lot of physicians, create the virtual patient, test it on them, see if they felt it was real. Now I think you also have some PowerPoint slides which you're going to show, which shows some more details so of the clinic space experience, including patients. Let's take a look at some of those slides and then we'll finish up. Okay, I've just finished here and the, sent the patient to the ICU because she was uh, stabilized. So you saved her? Yes, he yes saved we her. have. We saved her life. And so now then, let's look at uh, some of these different spaces that we can have uh, virtual patients in. So you have multiple uh, op operating venues or medical venues. It's not just mm -hmm. the emergency room. Mm -hmm. Or spaces, Right. multiple spaces. Here is one that is an instance, just like we showed you, with uh, a lot of urgent care, emergency uh, tools that you would expect to see in an emergency room. I'll go to the next one where you see a simpler uh, environment, a caregiver uh, standing by the bed of a patient <coughs> um, who was, you saw in the last scenario, and here would be like a ward. And at the head of the bed is a sphygmomanometer. Uh, you, there's no oxygen supply in this room, but the simplest of tools where the patient is being cared for like after surgery or uh, say after a heart attack. And here is another one where there is no patient, and this would be in a clinic. And so you'd see your physician uh, or caregiver in a clinic someplace, and here is still another environment that would look like a ward. And so a number of different kinds of spaces with different tools, different appearances, and so forth. I might mention that we have also created military spaces which uh, you, you, we haven't shown here, but it's one of these gigantic military tents, uh, I don't know what they call them, where we have taken the same medical objects we have and put them in that tent with people who are in, in army uniforms. So that might be a mass casualty place where you have dozens of it people could being be. treated. Or it could be really um, the people being flown in mm -hmm. from uh, from the war front. Or an infield hospital. We are thinking about doing one for a helicopter, for example, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. uh, transport patients. Now, mm -hmm. illustrated here is a intelligent medical object that we talked about, giving IV fluids in this scene. And so a number of choices that a uh, physician or nurse knows clearly about. And the uh, type of saline, if you've chosen fluid, and if you've chosen saline, then there are a number of different um, amounts and volumes and rates of flow. And so these are the kinds of decisions that must be made in, uh, that are predicated by the condition of the patient. Mm -hmm. And so on that goes. And so here would be a patient and on the left side is the wall monitor of a patient much like we saw before and took care of. And here, uh, after they have been resuscitated and treated. And so the vital signs are much more normal here and would not uh, create anxiety uh, among a group of caregivers. Now, behind this model is a set of concepts about the physiology of the body. And I want to tell you a little about that mm -hmm. because it characterizes in the simplest terms what is happening and how this changes. So based upon, in the case of hemorrhage, how much blood volume ha has gone down and the blood pressure goes down, the heart rate goes up and the oxygen saturation goes down and the respiratory rate goes up, the patient begins exhibiting that. And here is a, the pregnant female we saw before, this auto injury, and the EOIS is the organ injury scale that's used around the world to describe the uh, situation with patients. She's really bleeding rapidly. And I'm going to show you what happens to her vital signs as they develop. These are in minutes. And so you see for the first five or six minutes of heavy bleeding, the patient is 
in uh, is able to accommodate and compensate and the vessels constrict and the blood blood pressure is maintained and then it begins failing and the heart rate goes up the blood pressure goes down etc now we just have a couple of minutes left so so let me ask you this computers and medical education this is a field that's growing very rapidly what do you see coming up next what are the next developments applying computer technology to medical training so we really feel that uh, this type of learning is what we would call experiential learning. It's something that's very different from the kind of factual learning that you have in a classroom. This is trying to take the real world and bring it to you in a way that's safe and you can experiment. We think that this is going to be something that every profession is going to adopt. We are doing it with medical, but there's no reason you couldn't do it in business. I it's like case-based learning in business, but an immersive case-based learning. You already have flight simulators for it's people just who like fly flights, planes? Absolutely, yes. It's flight simulator taken mm -hmm. to the professional world. Uh, they are serious virtual games in a sense. Um, and people do think that uh, given the, 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 the demographics of people who are accustomed to using this, more and more we're going to see a combination of this type of simulation in an immersive world overlaid with game-like uh, play, where we will have collaboration and competition, and uh, we will actually individually and as organizations interact through our learning. Yeah. I'd love to ask more questions, but I've gotten the signal that we're just about out of time, okay. so we are going to have to wrap the show. I'd like to thank my two very distinguished guests, Dr. Leroy Heinrichs and Parvati Dev, co-founders of Innovation and Learning, which created Clinispace. Thank you for watching. Visit our website, www.futuretalk.net. For Future Talk, I'm Marty Wasserman, and we'll see you next time.